Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> so another update here. So thinking in a pandemic, part four, part four. So this is a great one, the logical fallacy, the Texas sharpshooter. And this one is so classic and it comes with a great story. So I always like a fallacy that has a great story behind it, but it's, it makes it easy to understand and recognize this fallacy. And it is everywhere. Oh my gosh, this is one of our m favorite thinking or not thinking tools. So the story goes like this, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. A, uh, an insurance salesman is driving around in rural Texas and he drives up to a farm and he looks over and he sees on the barn uh, side of a barn, he sees a target. And in the middle of the target, there's three bullet holes. And he thinks to himself, wow, somebody's, you know, a, a really good shot. I mean, somebody's a sharpshooter over here. That's an incredibly impressive set of shooting. And so he goes up to the door and knocks on the door and the farmer comes to the door and he says, hi, you know, I'm a insurance salesman, but really I'm mostly interested. Are you the guy that, you know, is doing that shooting and the farmer says oh absolutely that's me he says if you like i can i can show you how to how to do that and the wow well, the insurance salesman's like really because i'd love to learn to do them and that is some impressive shooting so the farmer says yeah just a second let me go get my gun so he goes in the house gets his gun comes back out and walks over and has a can of paint and says okay and he just picks the gun up and he goes blam 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 and shoots the side of the barn three times and then he walks over with the paint and he paints a bullseye around the three shots where they landed and then paints the bigger circle and the bigger circle until his three shots are right in the middle of the target. <clears throat> Texas sharpshooter. So this is when data is selected, uh, is circled to make it look like it hit right in the center, right? This is selecting your data sort of after the fact. Um, and, and, and circling the data that you really like and that really makes you feel good about whatever it is uh, you're doing. So instead of trying to figure out which data would be accurate and most helpful, we tend to circle the data that we think uh, supports the ideas that we like, and we tend to ignore the data that does not support the ideas we like. So um, examples. So of course, the pandemic examples are rife. Um, one that you'll see in the news, again, if you read a little bit of the news, you'll notice that people want, of course, which is perfectly reasonable again, people want the pandemic not to be so bad. So they've, uh, many of these th arguments I've, I've heard around say, hey, look, um, you know, yeah, r yes, right now there's so many cases and so many deaths, but we know there's a lot of people who have the virus who have not been tested. And so really the mortality rate, the death rate is much lower because we know a lot of people haven't been tested. So I'm going to go with this number that I'm making up. Notice I don't know how many people that is. Um, and then divide that into the number of deaths and voila, the mortality rate goes to the floor. Yay. So then they just use a multiplier, three or four or five or whatever that number they decide should be. Now on one hand, this is not unreasonable. So we know there are more people who have the virus than have been tested. The problem, though, is this: the number that they've circled, the number that they like, this is like, oh, this, this death rate over here, we're going to fix that, circle it, and then we'll divide by this number that we sort of speculate, which is not an unreasonable speculation, by the way. The problem is the number that they circled, the one that they like, also is an unknown. So while we have a certain number of people who have died, and they've said that number are people who have the coronavirus. Certainly, just like there's more people who have the virus than we know, there's more people who have died of uh, the of coronavirus than we know, because you know people get an infection, people have had other problems, and they haven't been tested, and so they just say, well, they died of pneumonia. Um, but where did that pneumonia come from? Well, we don't know, right? And so I'm not, I'm not blunt criticizing, by the way. You know, testing is ramping up. But you can't choose one number and say, oh, that number is fixed. And this other number, which we have, we don't like. So we'll get rid of the one we don't like and we'll circle the one we like. And then we'll change the math and voila. So yes, absolutely more people have the virus than have been tested. But this also means that more people have died of the virus who have not been tested. It's a, you know, you can't just change one of those numbers. That's um, essentially cheating. Um, but so what the true mortality rate is, we don't know right now. I mean, they, we have 
the best guess and estimates that are people doing. And it is reasonable to try and make these guesses and estimates, but it is not reasonable to circle one number, decide that number is good, circle the other number and say, we don't like that number, right? So this is the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, this continuing desire to choose one data point or a couple of data points that we like and ignore uh, all of the, exclude all of the items that we do not like. And it's, it's again, so difficult to avoid um, this error because you really have to be careful. Numbers are so dangerous in this sense because, you know, we go, oh, you know, what is the best possible data? That's not a question we tend to ask. We tend to ask what's available, what can I find, what's useful to me, what supports, most importantly, what supports my ideas. So if my ideas are that everyone's going to die, then I can choose numbers one way. If, if everybody's, this is not a big deal, there's nothing to worry about, then I can choose the numbers another way. But the only, if you're really trying to think about this, the question, and it is a difficult question, by the way, which is I think why we avoid this, is to say, what data do I need and how do I understand it in a meaningful sense? And by the way, this is not an easy problem. I mean, you know, how do you think through testing rates versus likely uh, presence of the disease rates in the population versus, um, you know, mortality rates versus where do we see this going in the future? I mean, all of this is really, for instance, even if you think of testing rates, how accurate are the tests? These tends apparently is quite variable. So we're getting test results. We're getting more test results, not as many as scientists would like. But how accurate are the test results that we are getting? This is also trying to, you know, trying to improve the quality of the tests that we're actually getting the feedback from. So, if, for instance, if it's throwing a bunch, a lot of the tests are throwing up a lot of false negatives, which is to say people who are tested, who have the COVID-19, who are n coming back as negative, as not having it, well, in the situation, even a, you know, a few 5% a uh, false negative rate would be, you know, that would change things considerably. Same thing on the false positive rate, you know. So the, the numbers are squishy and trying to think about the best way to understand them uh, is difficult. A related problem here, although it's not officially, this is not actually a, a, a fallacy, at least as far as I know, I don't know like a name for it. But you see it when people try to think about numbers um, consistently what we tend to do is we say, okay, I'm going to freeze the universe. Every variable in the universe is going to be frozen where it is, and I'm going to just alter this one. And then I'll track what I think the outcome will be against a fixed universe. Now, of course, you know, this is, actually this tendency comes from science, because in scientific experiments, what they try to do is control as carefully as they can for all possible variables, so they can understand and study one or the interaction of one or two as best as, 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 as they possibly can. Because once you get a couple of variables feeding back into each other, the complexity just becomes essentially untrackable. Uh, quantum computing, please come forward soon. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is the problem for, for this. And so when we do this in our minds, what we tend to say is, oh, we're going to fix, um, I go, okay, um, I'm going to make more money in the future. Say this is so. So I'm going to fix all, everything else. So my expenses are whatever. You know, I don't know. Pick a number. Five thousand dollars a month. Well, wow, good for you. You have a lot of expenses. But you know, so you have a certain amount of expenses. Say five thousand dollars a month. And I go, oh, but next year I'm going to make six thousand dollars a month. And man, am I going to be so much more wealthy than I am this year? People think this all the time. Um, if if you look at what people do behaviorally, though is they alter their expenses relative to their income. And so what in our minds we fix expenses often, in fact, almost invariably, uh, rise or fall to, to income expectations. Not necessarily to income, by the way. It does to that too, of course, but, but to income expectations. And so there's this, so that, that extra money actually sort of never arrives. Uh, because we've already priced it in, in our minds, and the uh, growth, that excess, gets sucked up because the variables that we had fixed go unfixed. 
right, are not actually fixed. And almost everything in the world feeds back, is in all these feedback loops. And so when you change something, other things start to change around it. And so it makes it very difficult to understand and predict behaviors and outcomes of systems as we're experiencing now. But I'll, 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 what we're in the middle of a great example of this is the, again, the pandemic gives you an example. The um, doctor who, one of the doctors, the epidemiologist who's really key with the, with the British government, um, has just came has come out and said he's revised his forecast down, and so now people are going, oh, so it's not going to be as horrible as you said, and you know you can sort of see the kinds of attacks that are being uh, leveled against this gentleman, and he so he had to actually come out and clarify. He's like, look, no, the reason it's not going to be as bad now, he says, this may change as I th- projected it might be is because we've done all this social isolation, we've put everybody, we've shut down England, right? Boom. And he says, so hopefully, if this projection go out, you know, it's not going to be as bad as it would have been by projections if we had done nothing. But so people, so that, so there's a feedback loop, doing things influences the outcome. And so if we do a bunch of things, and the outcome is not terrible, people can will then say, well, it wasn't terrible. Or it wasn't as bad as you said it was going to be. And it's like, right, that's that's the feedback loop, right? That's why you do those things is so it's not that terrible. Um, and But but again, we have this, uh, it, by, by the way, this is tracked very carefully. Lots of studies done on this. We basically can't track more than one variable at a time. And so mentally, we almost always fix every other variable. It's really difficult. People with training who do this a lot can track a couple, but no more than maybe two. And so everything else you just have to do on paper uh, or, you know, on computer. Otherwise you you can't, basically you can't project it. You can't, you can't intuit statistical interactions and these kinds of modelings uh, essentially at all, which makes sense, right? We didn't evolve in those kinds of environments. And so uh, when people look at it, they go, oh, well, you said it was going to be this number. Now that number is lower. And so you were wrong. It's like, because the feedback loop is kicking in, that's the idea was to not have that higher number, but let's get this lower number. And so, um, but again, we struggle with this kind of dynamic system. And then, of course, if we change behavior again, that will feed back into the system. And, and so it goes. And, you know, the classic example of this that we've all lived through um, recently is the runs on toilet paper, which is always the example that psychologists and planners use is they say, look, you know, the U S has always been able to produce enough toilet paper. There is no reason to expect we won't be able to produce enough toilet paper. So there is no shortage of toilet paper. However, once people started thinking there might be a shortage of toilet paper, they started projecting that out and they said, well, I don't think I'm worried about it, but if I decide that somebody else is worried about it, then I'd better go and buy toilet paper. This is the variable I can control. And so then all of these purchases are basically pulled into the present because everybody's worried about the dynamic behavior of other people. And so this creates a shortage that is, in fact, does not exist. And so that kind of dynamic behavior and feedback loop it can be quite powerful, sufficiently powerful that a country that's never shown a real tendency to be short on toilet paper can suddenly begin to run out of toilet paper. But it's not a, uh, it's, it's because this system is dynamic, because the psychology kicks in. And it's hard, hard to, if you have two or three of those variables working, to figure out what all of this means. So um, as we're thinking about the pandemic, keep this in mind. One, Texas sharpshooter, we have to be really careful of the data we choose to highlight. And when there's a lot of data, you always have to highlight some. You know, how are we using it? How are we thinking about it? How is it being presented to us? Um, you know, that we're not just circling the ones we like or the ones we dislike, depending on what kind of case we're trying to make. Um, and two, that when you're in a complex multivariable scenario, which we are, the world multivariable, um, fixing, trying to fix the universe, freeze it, and then just vary one thing, is uh, almost always gives bad results. And, and it's understandable because we want to reduce complexity. But when you have systems that feed back into each other, dynamic world, a world where we have plenty of toilet paper until people decide we might not and then we don't, right? That fear 
feed, feedback loop leads into that. Um, you know, that, that sort of actual dynamic, interactive, uh, real time experiences is, is what's happening now. And so it will be fascinating as we go forward, of course, in a year, two years, when we can look back and look at the data, we'll go, oh, you know, it'd be, it'd be much interesting. I think I can't wait. I'm actually, you know, excited to see uh, which of these projections was most accurate. What were the models uh, that, that did give the best uh, assumptions and, and give the clearest guidance? But it's going to take a while to figure that out. So until then, until we can look back and know, you know, just be careful with that thinking and try to be as clear as possible. Thank you.